Okay. Uh, so yesterday and on Monday, right? Uh, so just remember what we saw. So first, I show you a proof of area law uh, for temperature bigger than zero, right? Which is when you have a thermal state uh, using then it's a mixed state. We have to we use the mutual information. We use the mutual information between x and some uh, in the complement, and we saw it goes like some constant over temperature times the area, right? And then and then it was it was not not hard, right? So it was basically you know uh, James principle, right? And some basic props of uh, relative entropy. Then we saw that in one dimension, uh, if we have an area law, I mentioned for S max and S max woof, right? Then this is, this is very interesting because this implies that the state. Uh, is a matrix product state, right? Or can be very well approximated by a matrix product state. So, and 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 if you came in the tutorials, uh, Winter showed you that they are very useful, right? So you can you know compute things efficiently on them, and you just need a few number of parameters to describe them. Uh, so this is one justification for studying area loss, at least in one dimension, right? So, you know, I didn't give you any, just, just a comment, I didn't give you any uh, consequence of this kind of area law. And in fact, we don't know any consequence. So we don't know even in one dimension if this implies anything interesting about the structure of the states more than the area law itself. So perhaps it was, no, perhaps the reason why it's so easy it was so much easier to prove this one than as you see in the zero temperature case is that this is not the right notion, perhaps. But About sorry, uh, yeah, it does. It tells us some interest about correlations, yes, but doesn't gives us more in terms of, in terms of ansatz. It doesn't give us anything. Right. Uh, okay, then uh, then we start analyzing the the zero temperature case, right? And the first thing that I mentioned is that at least for critical models, when the gap closes, right? In general, there is no area law, right? Which, which is something that perhaps uh, you know people were not expecting because if you at least look at uh, models that are described by conformal field theory, you always have area law with law correction. But here, there are models with volume law, so it, we need something more, right? And and this is something uh, I, I start explaining to you is perhaps a, no, a notion of correlation length or a gap, right? Uh, and, then, and then I show you some, uh, let me write here. I, we discuss again correlations in quantum states, in bipartite quantum states. We already did that on the first day, right? But then we introduced one more way of analyzing correlation. So let me remind you the three ways that we, that we have, that we saw. One is trace norm. Uh, so we have a state, right, rho AC, a bipartite state. And this was one way, right, to quantify correlations, how far the state is from a product state, which has no correlation. These are the reductions. Of course, the mutual information we could use. Uh, and then this new, right, this new way of, of quantifying correlations that I introduced in terms of the covariance, right, which we work a lot in these two lectures. So the covariance of A and C on the state row, we define as we maximize over some operator x for which the operator norm is smaller than 1, y is smaller than 1. This will act on the space of A, this on the space of C. And then we look at trace x, y, 
rho a c minus rho a for c. Right? So as I mentioned, the difference between these two, and we saw this on the first day, right? That trace norm we can also write as something like this, this guy here. But here we can use any 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 measurement that we want, right? Any you know global guy here. Whereas in the in the covariance we only can use local guys. Um, then uh, I argue that the reason why we have to work with this one. If, uh, so okay, so as you see, this is is much more complicated to work with than these two others. They 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 no, they have better properties. But the reason why we have to work with this one was a uh, was a result that I mentioned, right? Originally proved by Hastings that if we have a Hamiltonian with a gap uh, and we look at the ground states, then if we look at correlations using the covariance of A and C, right? So we imagine we have the states, the ground states. We have A here, C here. This is the distance between the sets, right, that we saw. Then this is always the case as 2 to the minus this distance <coughs> over correlation length, right? And this correlation length is proportional to inverse of the gap. Okay? So, you know, if we're interested in ground states, we know that they have decaying correlations using this one. And the last thing that I did, uh, was to to, uh, to give some, try to give a, uh, some intuition why area law should hold whenever we have a correlation length, right? Whenever the correlations decay fast enough. And this was this very, uh, where, let me see. This very simplistic, right, uh, uh, argument that I also mentioned it's, it's not correct, right? That we have some region X, some region X complement. And then suppose we're interested in the entanglement between x and x complement, right? And then you know the, the intuition comes to uh, if you if you assume we suppose that we can break this entanglement into contributions of the entanglement between x and each one of x i complement, right? Where <coughs> these are the sites in x i, right? So x one complement, x two complement, and so on. So if you could do such thing. Then, you know, and again, because the correlations are very small here, we could imagine that this decays roughly like it as a correlation, right? So this decays exponentially. And then we have something decaying exponentially like that. If you sum off, then we get something, right? This would be, as we saw, roughly to order the correlation length, which is what we expect, right? So, you know, it would be very, uh, it would be nice if this would work, but uh, as I mentioned, this. We first, we don't know any any relation like this, and we have go good reasons to not expect one, right? Namely, because uh, we we understand well in uh, you know also from quantum information computation that entanglement can be very non-locally encoded, right? So you know these two guys can be entangled, but you will not see this entanglement just by looking at the entanglement of x with each one of these particles, right? So we need some more refined arguments, okay? Yes. Um, you mean here? Yeah. That uh, right. If this, you know, if you could write a, a relation like this, then indeed here you could estimate by something that decays exponentially. But it's, uh, what I'm saying is that this relation actually is false. It's something that doesn't work for anything. But yeah. it's something that is very intuitive, but it doesn't work. And oh, okay. yeah, simply this. Yeah, you know, what I'm saying is that this is the reason why. From the top of your head, you might imagine area law holds from from uh, correlation length, but this is simply not the way to go, right? Entanglement is more subtle than that. And it doesn't work because of principle. Simply because you can have you can have situations where this is very big, but if you just look at this, this is extremely small. So it's just is is an important property of entanglement, right? They, they can be non locally encoded. Okay, so is there any question on, on this that we saw in the last two lectures? Whenever you're 
Sorry? Fidelity. Fidelity. Yeah. yeah, I'm using trace norm instead of fidelity, right? But you could you could use here, for example, like fidelity between this and this if you want. It's another way of right. Uh, right. So let me see how I where you want to start. So what I wanna uh, do today is to keep trying to you know to build some uh, some relations between correlations, the K of correlations and, and area law. Right, so show some other, other uh, avenues that you could try to go to prove it and show also that we get stuck there. But then, and then this will uh, put us in the right way, in the right direction. Uh, and, and this would be a good way to introduce many uh, useful things in quantum information theory in itself. Uh, like, for example, you know, entanglement distillation protocols. I go to that in the end of the lecture. You see it more uh, next week in Eric's lectures, but I already introduced this to you today. So, um, so what I want to anal analyze is uh, well, more generally, the care cor correlations versus area law. Um, all right. So, uh, so the situation that, that I'm interested in, suppose uh, we have a one-dimensional system and we have three regions, A, B, and C. There is a state there, and this state, you know, it has the K of correlations, okay? So, can be some, you know, suppose that this, this is satisfies for this state, this kind of clustering of correlations. And now, you know, suppose we want to prove that there is an area law for A. So the, the amount of entropy here scales is a constant, right? Doesn't scale with the size, okay? Um, now, uh, now what I want to do is uh, suppose first that we have uh, uh, the K of correlations in trace norm, right? Which, as I mentioned, simplifies things. So suppose that we knew that this is very small. Okay, this is like smaller than some epsilon. Then one thing that is true, and I want to show you now first, is that from this kind of uh, small correlations between A and C, you can indeed get an uh, area law for A. Okay, and this is, uh, okay, so let's see how, how it goes. So to do that, the, the key thing to achieve this uh, is to use a, uh, a result, so a theorem due to a woman that appears everywhere in quantum information. It's uh, one of the most useful things like in, you know, in quantum communication, in channel capacities and so on. Uh, so this is this woman purification theorem. Woman purification and I don't have a reference but you can find in Nielsen Schwank this. Um, sorry? So A is here, B is here, C here, and this A is only bit, is the reduced state on A and C. So we're tracing out, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, le let me write this. So, um, here. So this AC equals to the partial trace over B of the full state, right? on ABC, okay? Uh, all right, so the, what the theorem says is that if we're given two states, <coughs> and they, they are density matrix on this vector space S, and they are such that the one norm, the, no, the distance between them is small, so they are close state, they are close to each other, then uh, for for all, or for then uh, uh, then given a purification uh, psi se 
of row S, um, the maximum, oh sorry, the, uh, the minimum over phi on S E, which are purifications of sigma E. This trace norm is small. I, I I don't check how small, but it's like something like this. I think. Okay, so this is a. In the afternoon, we can do this as exercise to derive this. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, one thing I don't know. Uh, did we did I introduce purifications to you? Who doesn't know what the purification is? Raise their hands. Okay, all right, so, so it's very simple. So, so, right, so before I explain this theorem, let's see what the purification is. So, uh, given a state like rho s, okay, we say that uh, acting on this vector space s, we say a state, a pure state psi s e, which acts now in the vector space s and plus some other, some extra space e is a purification of rho s if the following is true. If, if you take the partial trace over e of psi s e, we recover the state, OK? So it's simply any, any pure state for which, if you take the partial trace over some extra system, we recover the state rho s. All right, so it's you know it's so uh, maybe we can work uh, we can do uh, some exercise about this in the afternoon. But uh, for any state, of course, there is always a purification. And one important thing that we're going to use that I'll just state now is that all these purifications they are related to each other. Okay, so so some some results that I won't show you now. So uh, if you have uh, if psi s e and phi s e are purifications of rho s, then uh, there exists some, in general, some isometry. So, uh, you know, I isometry can just think, uh, a good product is just a unitary, but isometry is just you can first append some you know, tensor product, some pure state, and then apply some, some big unitary there. So you know, up to some, uh, some unitary transformation uh, that let's call V on the system E, okay, it only acts on E, the following is true. Uh, psi on S E equals to identity on S. You do nothing on the system itself. You apply this, you know, this change of basis to the uh, purifying system. The Z we call it purifying system sometimes, and then these two guys are the same. Okay, so in a sense, purif purification it's you know uh, it, it's unique, right? Because they are all related by some change of basis in the purifying system. Okay. Yes. Uh, this minimum. Yes, you could also take just you fix some purification and like you know anyone and you you do over this guy. Yes, that's a way, uh, another way of writing. So let's go back here. So what's this, what this uh, theorem says? It says that you're giving two states and they are close to each other, okay? Uh, then we are interested, then, then you pick any purification you want of rho, for example, psi. Uh, then you want to understand how close uh, the purifications of rho, uh, this purification of rho is from some purification of sigma, okay? So in general, if you just pick any purification of rho and any purification of sigma, they might not be close. But what the theorem is saying is that given any purification of rho that you choose, you can always find one of sigma for which they are still close. Okay? So you can, you can boost uh, the fact that these two states are close to the purifications being close as well. Uh, all right. So, so why I'm telling you this? Let's see, let's see now how we can apply this result to this situation that we're interested in, and see what it implies about the entropy of A, for example. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, so now again we have this, right? This is our assumption, right? And 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 w again, why this is our assumption? Well, because b is in the middle, right? And we assume that b, you know, it's like the size of b is l, so l is sufficiently large such that these two are far away, and we can use. And, and if we had this kind of decay of correlations, this, this would be very small, right? So now, one, one very simple case is, let's analyze first. Suppose that this is not just small, but this is actually zero, okay? Uh, so there's no correlations at all. So now, let's see that we have area law. Um, so let's consider one purification. We can, let's try to apply this Ullmann theorem. So to apply it, we have to choose one purification for rho AC. So let's choose as this purification just the original state, right? By construction, the original state is a purification. So we can choose it. So we look at psi A DC is a purification of rho AC. Okay? Uh, so now let's also choose purifications for rho A and rho C. And this uh, oh, sorry, a purification for rho, rho A tends to rho C. And we can, you know, there are many purifications, but one particular purification is that we purify locally A and locally C, right? So we can write the states of this form, uh, at A, A dash. This is just a purification for, uh, let me write first, then I, and uh, and this is such that, uh, Eta a, a dash is a purification for rho A, and this guy is a purification for rho C. Okay? This, of course, we can always do, right? So this guy has its sets of purifications. We choose one of them and one for the other. Now, what we know by this lemma, this thing that I just showed you, is that assuming first that they are the same, that these two states are equal, right? So if rho AC equals to rho A tensor rho C, then there must exist some isometry, V, uh, that maps uh, B to A dash C dash. Okay, so, so this is just the input space of the isometry is B and the output is this one. And this satisfies the following. Uh, this identity on AC Tensor product. This isometry on B applied to this to the purification of this guy. This one must be equal to this the another purification of this guy, which is this, right? Because this is a purification of this tensor product, and they are the same for now. So we have this relation. Okay, uh, so so you know in in a picture, what we are saying is that we have our original state, psi a b c. Then we can just apply a change of basis here, right? This is applying v here, and after this change of basis, we have entanglement between a and some subsystem here, right? So this is like this uh, a overline and entanglement between a c and a subsystem here. Okay, so this is right. This is a, a, a table is very simple here. So, so this guy A can only be entangled with the rest via this <coughs> subsystem B here, right? So the dimension of this, you know, the uh, we know that uh, the entanglement of A with the rest is just the entropy, right? So we want to understand the entropy of A. But now this guy is product, right? They stay here. This one is. <coughs> these two states, uh, you know, they, they are product, right? These two states. <coughs> so if you look at the amount of entanglement of A, which is just the entropy of A, this is completely irrelevant, right? This is like something which is in the tensor product. So this doesn't contribute to the entanglement. So the entanglement of A, the entropy of A, is just equal to the entropy of A bar, okay? But this is a small system, right? This can be at most the entropy of B. Right, because we just take the reduced state on, on B, rho B, 
and we apply some change of phases. So we cannot change this entropy, and then we just take some parts of it. All right? So, so this argument just shows that the entanglement of A, the entropy of A, can be at most the entropy of B. But this B, right, so we just have to choose, you know, if uh, this B is something that doesn't have to scale, right? It can be something of some fixed size. So we have some area law, right? We have a bound on the entropy of A. So in the case of approximations, it's very similar, right? So I, I don't want to give you all the details. So we, we can uh, work it out later. But suppose that th this, this is satisfies, right? So they are just close after this epsilon in trace norm. Then we can now use Ullmann's theorem, <laughs> this guy here, right? And this tells us that there is this isometry for which these states are not the same, but they are close, again, up to epsilon, right? But now, uh, so for, for this guy, in this state, we know that this relation is true, that the amount of entropy on A is bounded by the size of B. And now we want to argue about this guy, right? But then we just, you know, we, we just saw on the first day that entropy, it's, it's continuous, right? That is like funnies, right? So we saw this in the first lecture. So applying funnies inequality in the, in the right way, using continuity of entropy, you can get, you can get that the entropy of A in this guy, in the original one, it's, it's small, okay? Any question? So you know, if, if it's the first time you're seeing this, it takes some time to, uh, to digest it, but yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, sorry, say again, I didn't. Depending, depending on where I can remove change from B. Yes. It's partial with A, partial with A, and partial with B. Oh, but. Well, you can, uh, w you can do that, but this is a consequence of, in the exact case of this result, right? That all purifications are related by some change of basis in the purifying system. Yeah. So yeah, because of this, you can do. In the case of approximations, you just have to see that things are continuous enough, and this guarantees it, right? So uh, okay, so why I told you all of that? Just the the the, whole, the you know the, the message here is that if we had uh, a notion of correlation length of the gear of correlations in trace norm, we are done, right? We have area law, okay? And this works. I I did one dimension for simplicity, but it works in n dimension. So this is a very strong notion of PKF correlations and, and a very good one. But unfortunately, it's not the one we have, right? So, so let's go back now to the notion that we know appears in physical states, this using the covariance, and see what it tells us. Any more question about this first? <coughs> yes. Well, which parts? Yeah, you know, in the picture, what this argument is saying is that uh, we have this entanglement between A and the rest. But what we can do is you apply some change of phases to the region B, which is some small region, and then you decouple these two regions. Okay, so A is only entangled with a subsystem of B, and C is only entangled with the subsystem of B. But because, you know, so, so this means that the amount of entanglement of A can be at most the size of B, right? Because uh, as we saw, the amount of entanglement is always is more than the minimum of the dimension of the two subsystems, right? The minimum of the log of the dimension. Sorry? Or oh, in the result? Okay, so th the thing is that, I, I, as you mentioned, I didn't introduce fidelity, right? And if I had introduced fidelity, it's very nice, the epsilon is the same. Because I didn't introduce fidelity, I'm going via the trace norm, you lose something. And I even have to work <laughs> out what you lose exactly, but you know, it's some function of epsilon which goes to zero when epsilon goes to zero. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if what I wrote is correct. Uh, all right, so now the question, right? So can we replace? This covariance, the correlations of A and C by the trace norm difference. 
right? So you know, if, if the same result I just showed you was true using this covariance, then we'll be done, right? Um, okay. So so first, let me show you, or 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 in other words, if we can, if they are always related somehow in, in a good enough way, right? So if you can always upper bound one by the other and vice versa without losing too much, then the same kind of thing would work, right? So let me show you the best result that we have of a relation between them first. So the following is true. So one thing that I already told you, right, is that this trace norm, uh, trace, trace norm difference is always bigger than the covariance. Right, simply because here we are maximized over, over global measurements and here only on the under local measurements. So now the interesting relation, if there is one, is this, right? Whether there is a lower bound of covariance in terms of trace knot. And here there is one, but it's you lose a lot. So it's um, so So this is the relation. So again, there is a relation, but you lose something that goes as a dimension of the subsystems. Okay, so GA is the dimension of, of A, GC the dimension of C, and you lose something like one over dimension square. Okay? So so these are you, you know, we can prove in the afternoon as an exercise, it's very simple to prove this. But now maybe maybe there is a much better bound, right? We simply don't know. You know, A since this is going with the dimension, this makes this useless. Okay, so if you just try to make the same argument. The epsilon from the approximation has to be something that goes like dimension, and then and then it's it's not very useful. Yeah. Well, here to here, yes, but right, we have two relations, right? One is this one, and another one is this one, right? So, you know, this do, this didn't have to be true, from right, at first, but it's true. Uh, so now the question is whether this tight or not, or you know, if you can have something much better. Uh, and 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 the and the answer is no. We cannot improve this substantially. Okay, and and the reason is because we have this very interesting kind of quantum correlations that people have been studying for a while now in in quantum information theory, and they call this uh, this kind of correlations uh, or this kind of states that have these correlations quantum data hiding states. So I want to show you an example now of this. Okay. And, and this will be uh, this will be very bad news of trying to to make rigorous what I told you, right? Trying to go from small correlations to area law just by using these tricks with, with purifications. Okay, so uh, let me show you what data hide is just by giving one example. Okay, I'll give you two examples. But, uh, the example is the following. So we have a state, and for it, row AC again, but this state, uh, it lives, is a density matrix on two d dimensional complex vector spaces. Okay, on this guy. And the states, it's actually equal is what we call the uh, anti-symmetric states or anti-symmetric Werner states. The state is given by the following thing. So we have identity on AC minus, this is the swap operator, I'll show you what it does. And we have to normalize. So the normalization is square minus D. So this guy, this is the flip of the swap operator. What it does is just, it changes, you know, so if you have a, a product state, this on A and this on C, it swaps it. So we have this. All right? So the, you know, if you just look at the action of this in the basis, we can, there is a unique representation of this guy and this is the one. Right, so this, uh, what you can do is you start, you can, uh, okay, one, one easy calculation you can do first is that you can look at the reductions. So row A is equal to row C, because it's symmetric if you 
change A and C. And then, you know, the partial trace here is, is identity again, absolute normalization. What? No, 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 it's a, it's a matrix, it's a matrix. It's a square matrix, right? So th this, is a, this is a density matrix, right? Yeah. So, so the dimension of this guy is, this is a matrix on, on a d square times d square, right? This as well and this guy as well. Okay, there. Okay. All right, so, um, so now first you can do this computation and you see that both of them, they are maximally mixed, okay? So the reduction is just identity over D. So now, one exercise you can do. We have the two states and they, and they are nice enough, so it's easy to compute the trace norm, right? And if you compute it, you see that it's roughly half. Okay, it's very close to half. Um, okay, so in, in trace norm, there is, a, there is a lot of correlations, right? The correlations, they are constant. In particular, when you increase D, they stay constant, bound away from zero. But now, you can, you can look at the covariance, right? You can look at correlations A and C on the states, rho C, okay? And this is, um, this is harder to compute, but you still can get bounds on it. And, uh, and, and I hope Eric will tell you more about this next week. What I wanna do now is just to quote the result, okay? So, uh, so, so basically using, you know, you see in Graham's lecture tomorrow something called PPT, positive partial transpose. This is some, uh, some notion of approximation of, of uh, separable states and of product states. So the way as you well. get this bound is you just relax this by some optimization over like PPT measurements instead of product measurements, and then you can prove the following: that this is always smaller than some than like two over d. Okay, so you have a huge gap here, right? So when d grows, this stays a constant. This goes to zero as one over d, two over d, right? So you know this is almost tight, right? Maybe we don't have a square, but we definitely have a d <laughs> there. So, so this is bad news, right, for us. So, uh, you know, this, we, we, we won't have anything like uh, Ullmann theorem, for example, for just covariance being small, <coughs> right? So it's just a much weaker notion. And, uh, okay, so, so why, uh, why the name data hiding? Let me just tell you. So, so first, people first found uh, this interesting because it has, like, cryptographic applications, and the application, one application is the following. Suppose that we have, Ellison and, and Charlie, they are far away, right? And they share, and, and they wanna play some, some uh, cryptographic game. They wanna encode one bit of information, which is accessible if they come together and make some measurement, but which is not accessible if they are separated, okay? If they can only make local measurements. So the game is that the bit is encoded whether they share the state row AC or whether they share the state row A tensor row C. Okay, if they can make global measurements, we saw that this, they can achieve this bias, right? So they can learn when they have this state or this one with very good uh, error, right? They error, you know, they, they make mistakes maybe like, you know, let's see, uh, like they make a mistake one quarter of the time, but they can, they can make a very good job. Uh, whereas if they only have local measurements like here, what this quantifies, they always make mistakes, right? The states are almost the same. So we have two states which are extremely close under local measurements, but they're actually very far away under global measurements, right? So this again, this, you know, this funny thing that happens in quantum states, right? This, uh, this is something quantum. We don't have this for probability distributions, for example. Is there a question? Yes. Sorry? Oh, it's not, no. Yes. Yes, but this just comes into the definition of the state, okay? I, I, didn't, I, I, did, I didn't even have to specify the state for you. It's just, the point I wanna make is just that there exist states with these properties, okay? And one concrete one is this one, but I didn't show you why, why this is the case. It's a unitary, right? It's a unitary op operator, but don't worry about this fault. It's just I, I want to give you the concrete example, but we don't use anything about it. Okay, so, 
So perhaps an example more to the point of, of the difficulties that we have is from her uh, random states. So suppose we have a, a state psi. You know, on, we arrange the particles on the lattice, and then we have A, B, C. And here we want to choose, suppose we choose dimension of A equals dimension of C, both much bigger than dimension of C, but this is very big as well. Okay? And now uh, we want to pick this state at random. So, so we pick these states at random from what we call the Haar measure. Okay? So, so this is the unique unitary, yes. yes. Oh, oh, thanks, yeah, B. Thank you. So, so this measure is a measure on pure quantum states, and the, it's the unique rotational invariant measure on quantum states. There is a very, very concrete way of, of drawing a state from the half measure. What you do is just you pick x, x uh, 1 plus, I, plus uh, square root of, of minus 1, y1, x2 plus i, y2, blah, 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 x, n, plus i, y, n, uh, n is two to the n, right, for n qubits. And all these guys, x1, y1, xn, yn, they are, they are identically and independently distributed Gaussian random variables with mean zero and variance one, okay? Uh, so you take this, this is a vector you can construct, right? So you just pick all the elements, the real parts and the imaginary parts of the coefficient independently and at random, and you normalize it. So you divide this by the norm to make it a, a quantum state, right? By the norm of the guy, okay? So this is what is here inside the norm here. And if you do that, you have, you know, you have picked a, a state from the Haar measure, okay? Um, so now, uh, as that example indicates, right, there are many counterintuitive features in quantum states, uh, and, uh, and quantum information is a very good, you know, is, is a place where they, all these counterintuitive features, they appear a lot. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and because of this, we don't have a very good intuition about this, uh, these quantum states. So, so a good way to study them is just to pick a state at random and see which properties it has, okay? So this approach we, we has been used a lot. And, and it teaches us a lot about quantum states, and we just want to do this here. Okay? We just want to pick a state at random and see which property it has. And what we observe is that uh, when we pick a state from the Haar measure, usually with very high probability, the state will satisfy a particular property. Okay? And this is what we want to see. This is what I want to show you now. So, so if you pick a state psi from the Haar measure, then uh, with high probability over the choice of the states, almost for all states, the following will be true. If you look at the correlation between A and C, then this is roughly one over dimension of B. Okay? In this regime. Uh, yes. Which parts? Or oh, oh this? Okay, so this just means that you, you, you pick this state psi Okay, at random, but now you have if, if you, you pick it at random, but you have to specify specify at random over which measure, right? And 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 the way you pick at random is over, over the half measure. A more concrete way of choosing these states is just picking the components independently at random from Gaussian variables of mean zero and variance one, and normalizing it. Okay. This is the first component of the of the vector x1 plus uh, square root of minus 1, y1, and so on. Okay? Yeah, you take the state at random by choosing the variables at random. Uh, so something like that, some state at random. Yes, right? So for each choice of these random variables, you have one state. So we have a distribution of states now. And we can understand, we can try to ask, like, uh, you know, what are typical properties of these random states? The state, is we, the state we call a state from the Haar measure, okay? One thing that you can prove is that this is a unique uh, rotational invariant measure. So it's the unique measure that 
if you apply, if psi is distributed from the Ha measure, then for any unitary u, this guy is distributed from the Ha measure again. Okay? So, uh, but, right. Or if you don't want to know the details, this is just a way of picking states at random, of constructing states with, with, prop, with perhaps interesting properties. So what you can compute, the correlations they will decay, right? Even like very fast with the dimension of B, right? One over dimension of B. So exponentially in the number of qubits of B. But now let's, let's look directly at entropy, right? So, so we have, so this shows that there is this state, and if this B is sufficiently big, there is very small correlations between A and C, right? Because of this. But let's look at the, ent the entropy. Let's look at the entropy of A. So there is some nice ways of computing uh, uh, entropy. Uh, so, and what we can prove again is with high probability, almost for all, uh, all uh, quantum states, this entropy will be bigger than log dimension of A minus some constant, some universal constant, divided by dA over dB dc. Okay. So A, the maximum entropy is log dA, because you know uh, this cancels, right? dA over dc, they are the same, they cancel, we have again one over dB. So if dB is big again, this is almost close to maximum, right? So, so this state has max almost maximum entanglement between A and the rest. On the other hand, the correlations are very small, okay? So this just shows that there is, there is no way of going from small correlations between A and C to, uh, to area law, right? To have small entanglement on A, okay? So in general, there is no relation. Any question on this? Let me see how I'm going. Right, so you know this first argument that I show you using using Ullmann's and trying to decouple these two regions, it's it's very appealing, but it cannot be the way we're going to prove it, right? If it's true. And you know, once you see this result, you can start to become pessimistic about area law, right? Maybe it simply doesn't hold true, because the reasons why we think it will hold true, they are right, they're flawed, uh, and and this is what. Uh, many people believed after this kind of these issues were understood properly understood, uh, but it turns out that there is a, a, a way out, and indeed area law uh, exists for gap systems, okay, in one dimension at least. So this was, you know, a, a breakthrough result in the area. And it's again by Hastings. It was very surprising when it was proved. No one was expecting, right? So this was the time when you know we people have worked out all these easy examples that I mentioned before, like like uh, quasi-free states or states you can map to quasi-free states like XY model or or Gaussian or, or you know models quadratic in position moment and so on. But no no general result was known. And then he gave a proof for any gap system. So let me tell you what's true. So if you consider again a triple of a Hamiltonian in one dimension, a gap and a ground state, okay, so so this, this ground state is unique, okay, there is no degeneracy. Uh, then we can find some constants such that uh, for all region X, again, right, we have the line, this is X, this is X complement. So for all X, we can bound the max entropy, the smooth one, like that. So this is the reduced state of the ground state, right? Or oh, actually, let me write like that the ground state, the reduced state on X. So there is an area law, okay? The bound is like exponentially big in the correlation length. We have some dependence on this moving, okay, like, like that. And, and 
as before, right? So the correlation length. is one over gap, roughly. Um, OK, so this, this sounds complicated, right? But first, forgetting about this movie, it's just a, it's a constant, right? It's a constant upper bound to the entropy. The entropy doesn't grow with the size of x. It's always upper bounded by this. So this is area law. We have, this, we have even this trade-off between smoothing here and the price you pay on the bounds. So, so what this implies is also uh, a, 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 a nicer looking area law for von Neumann entropy, if it's what you care most about. So we have such things. And as we saw yesterday, right, and Winton also discussed in the afternoon session, this also implies that the state is approximated by MPS. OK, so there is uh, MPS approximation. <coughs> OK, so everything that, uh, you know, it's, uh, Sorry? So oh, X is just a region, right? Yeah, in that region. Yes. So this is, you know, it's just a reduced state of the ground state. So they look, if you just measure something here, it says you're measuring the ground states, right? It's, I don't, I'm not sure if I understood. That's correct. Yeah. And also ask what's the correlation between two points in the x space. Oh yeah, you can, yeah. And and, and, we, and we know because of they do they decay exponentially, right? Because it's gapped. Oh, oh yeah, 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 sure. Yes. This is the correlation length of the state of, of decay of correlations, indeed. I this is the question, yes. This is just the correlation length, yes. I don't know how to write, but you know. Yeah. Yes, the bound is independent of the size of x. Yes, this is what, right? This is the area law. Right. 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 At finite temperature, yeah, yes. Yes. Right. But th but this doesn't say anything about this doesn't say anything about phase transitions, right? Because if you're close to phase transition, the gap closes, and then this bound is trivial. Okay. Because right, because the gap, you know, because of this. So when when the gap is of order one over n, or even one over log n, this bound is trivial already. Okay. So this is only useful for non-critical systems, systems far away from the phase transition. Uh, all right, so you know this was very nice results. Uh, he uses some machinery like from Lee Robinson bounds to, to understand local many body Hamiltonians. Some very basic information theory as well. Uh, again, connects to the relative entropy, but I don't. I don't want. I won't say anything more about the proof. Um, and 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 very recently there was some improvement that I that I want to. I don't want to mention. Uh, discuss it to you too by uh, Arad. Landau, Kitaev, and Vazirani. This is the paper. If you want to check it, it's a nice proof too. And again, the same bounds, but now the bound on the entropy is improved because it's just like constant times uh, times correlation length. Okay, so it's an exponential improvement over this bound. Okay, and again, the proof now is more combinatorial. It doesn't use Lee Robinson, but uses things. Very similar to Lee Robinson bounds, which in the end is, uh, uh, you know, the proof is combinatorial. Okay. So, uh, so if you want to draw some pictures, we have. Uh, sorry. No, the correlation length is a property only of the gap, right? It's like proportional to one over gap. No, compared to the first part. Oh, no, because right one is exponentially big in the correlation length. The other is just linear in the correlation length. So this is a better bound, right? This is smaller than this one. 
right? Okay, so same picture, we have a gap Hamiltonian. And we know, right, we saw last lecture that it implies, let's write exponential decay of correlations, okay? This is like. Uh, and we also saw, right, this is all in one dimension, which is where we understand well. If you have area law, and we also saw yesterday, this implies that we have this very good ansatz for the ground state that allows us to compute things, which is this matrix product state. Okay? Now, what, what I, I try to explore here now, whether we could complete this, right? Just by going from, from correlation length, decay of correlations to area law. And we saw some difficulties, right? So uh, the, uh, what Hastings did, he said, okay, maybe, maybe this is a dead end, let's go directly, right? So let's just, right, so go directly. This is his result, right? Uh, but you know, this, this is still missing and, and it's interesting problem in itself, right? So uh, what I, what I want to mention now uh, and start discussing and, and completing in, in the next lecture is that we all in, actually have this relation. Okay, this is also true. And this is the result I, I will focus on. Uh, no, it's a way to prove area law and it's the way I want to do it. Because it's, it's the way that uses most uh, quantum information theory uh, ideas. So this is uh, work by myself and Michal Horodesky. And this is a paper, if you want to check it. This is a uh, long one and there is a short one. And what it says is that uh, consider a state on a line, on a line, okay, one D, uh, that has uh, psi exponential decay of correlations, okay? So, A state has psi exponential decay of correlations. If the following is true, if uh, the correlations between A and C is exactly what we saw before, right? Decays as two to the minus distance between A and C over correlation length. Okay, so just say that the state has a correlation length. Then, if you look at S max, it's move again, of row X. So for all X, this is just a reduced state on region X as before. Well, so there exists constant C0, C1, C2. The same thing as for the gapped case, okay? So C0 exponentially in the correlation length and like log one over error, okay? So this is the result I want to focus. So in one dimension at least, if the state has a correlation length, we have area law and all the consequences as in the other case, and it goes again, the bound is exponentially big in the correlation length. Uh, probably this is not tight, but this is what we have, okay? And then we have just this natural sequence of implications, right? Um, so let me see. Is there a question? Okay, good. Uh, so you know, a, a few things that uh, that this result uh, might be better than. Uh, then the original one is when you have, you know, you have situations uh, when you don't have a gap, but you, you have what you call a mobility gap, okay? So like for these other systems, this happens. It might be gapless systems that nonetheless have uh, exponential decay of correlations. So, you know, this will apply uh, to
critical systems with mobility gap. There is some, if you want to check what this is about, there's two papers. Usually it's very difficult to prove that it has mobility gap, but if you can do it, then it has exponential decay of correlations. Okay, so you know, it's a, it's a richer class of states. I think more, more relevant, it also applies to degenerate ground states. Okay, and, and this, the other math didn't, so. Ground states. And I didn't state if you have many, uh, and, and the reason is that these ground states they satisfy a notion of clustering that I mentioned in the end of the last lecture. I don't want to repeat. And then you have a strengthening of this result for that notion of correlations, okay? So basically, if you have n degenerate ground states, you have this bound plus log n, the number of, of ground states. Uh, and. Don't they have no Sorry? Yeah, I, I don't want to define, but no, because it, it's, some, it's something in relation to localization, right? Many body localization, but uh, it will take some time. So, you know, these two papers, they, they give notions. It, it's interesting, and they prove from these notions that if they are satisfied, you have decay of correlations in the ground states, which is what I want to use here. But to, to verify that a system satisfies this, uh, this definition is very hard. But they know that, for example, x, y model with random coefficients satisfied. Although, you know, x, y is exactly solvable, so it's, it's easier. Uh, to thermal states, okay? In one dimension, of course. So what I mean by that, for any temperature bigger than zero, okay? Uh, so, so why is that? So, uh, again, I, I just want to mention this is because there is a result by Araki, 69. And he proved that you know, if you have a thermal state at any finite temperature, this has psi exponential decay of correlations. Okay? Which is why it comes from the fact that in one dimension you have no phase transitions, right? At constant temperature. That was just mentioned before. So so we always have psi exponential decay of correlations. Okay, this is good news, but this is a mixed state, right? We the theorem is for pure states. But what we can prove is that if you just consider purification of this guy of the following form. So So this is like EPR pairs, right? So you know, in, in a picture, you put many EPR pairs between the end sites, and some, this is the system. This is some copy of the system, and here you pro you apply this row half, the thermal state half. You can verify yourself that this is a purification. Our extension of the theorem that I won't I won't discuss is that if a mixed state has exponential decay of correlations, the purification will satisfy area law in the same sense, okay? In this sense. And from this we get, right, uh, we get the result for thermal states, okay? <coughs> so, yes? Very hard. No, but I, I guess more because of notation, okay? Because the <laughs> these people, they're interested in, in different kind of problems, right? So, you know, they want to show that the KMS state exists, and then they have to set up the notation for infinite dimensional systems, right? Like with lattice of infinite size. So, and, and, and I don't understand it. So it might be that it's not that hard. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, so, so this is just to, to argue for you that this is an interesting bound, right? And to motivate, and then now we want to study it. Ah, and, and I mentioned this also because, right, we saw this area law for mutual information, right? And this, as I mentioned, this is very interesting uh, as a result about correlations, but doesn't give us much in terms of, like, a proc you know, ansatzes for the states. This gives, right? But unfortunately, this only works in one dimension, okay? So maybe, maybe the right notion of area law for thermal states is to look at uh, area law for the purification, right? And see what, which properties it has. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, but uh, local, right? So, so you know, y y these are the sites, original. These are the original sites of the model. Yeah. You just put one, one extra one to each one of them, right? And you create some local entanglement here. Okay, so this, 
this is not the problem. This is just local entanglement. It doesn't hurt you. But of course, now you apply this guy, and then who knows what happens. But what we can show is that because this had the exponential decay of correlations, this state is still nice enough. So you satisfy area law, for example. OK? Uh, sorry? No, the good point, no. So you no, know, suppose you take this purification, which is a very local one, so it's nice. You apply some crazy unitary here, OK? This generates a lot of entanglements, right, in this cut. So this is completely spoiled. So it's very important to have the right purification. Um, right. Let me see how much more I wanted to say. Um, OK, so yes, please. Yes. And the dimension is, is oh yeah. Of the auxiliary dimension is again of the same order of the right hand side. Oh, uh, good question. So what, what you get from, from this yeah. is that there exists a matrix product state of bond dimension D, yeah. uh, which is a delta approximation to the states, where the bond dimension grows polynomially in in, the pro in delta and in n. Okay. So it's ah. it's polynomial bond dimension. You can improve and you can get constant bond dimension. But then the state is, is just such that the constant size regions are close. If you want to get a global approximation, the bond dimension has to go grow polynomially. Okay. So yeah, I, didn't, uh, I think I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, you can, yeah. So this is what we know about this. Um, so well, but maybe it's worth right, right? So, so uh, this implies that for all delta uh, and k, some integer, there exists some MPS bond dimension d, which is uh, which is. I forgot, but some polynomial, the exact polynomial in in one over delta uh, k, such that for all region x for which the size is smaller than k, if you look at the trace norm between uh, the original states on the region k and the MPS on the region k, this is more than delta. So this is the kind of approximation we have. And of course, if you want a global approximation, then this has to go polynomial, which is not great, but it's, it's still much better than the worst case, which is exponential, right? Uh, sorry, the DT. All right. So, so uh, the, the basic idea for, for proving this result will be to, to explore what uh, something that we study a lot and, and it's very important in, in like, you know, quantum communication uh, is, which is entanglement distillation. Okay, so uh, this is what we we have to study. Uh, but before we study that, let's go. Let's see again a random states. Let's revisit this, this random state example, OK? And, and, and show that it actually indicates something useful for us that we might want to explore. So imagine that we have a state again, psi is taken uniformly at random from the half measure. But now we consider a different splitting, OK? Now we consider that dimension of A equals dimension of B, and they are both much smaller than the dimension of C, OK? Um, for example, the size of A could be equal to the size of B, which is n over 8, and therefore the size of C must be 3n over 4, right? Because they have to sum to 1. Um, so now what we can do is, again, I show you that we know how to, I didn't show you, but you know, we know how to compute the, uh, if you take a state at random with high probability, we have a lower bound on the amount of entanglement, right, on the entropy. So let's look at entropy. So with high probability over the choice of the states, the entropy of the state on AB 
we can bound it, lower bound it by log dimension a b, right? The total uh, number of qubits minus some constant over dimension of a b. The bound is always the dimension of the subsystem we keep divided by the dimension of the system we trace out here c. Okay, so we have this relation. Um, okay, but so it's it's very mixed, right? And this implies something to us. So let's see. Let's just rearrange the, the equation. And it reminds that if you look at the relative entropy of, as we did in the first day, of rho AB to the maximum mixed state on A, maximum mixed state on B, uh, this is equal to log dimension minus entropy. And you see this is exactly what we have here, right? Log dimension minus entropy, this is smaller than something very small, okay? Um, good. Well, now we also saw, right, something that it's called Pinsker in the quality, right? And this is saying that if the relative entropy is very small, the two states, they must be close in trace not, right? So by Pinsker in the quality, uh, you can check the how you know the precise formulation in your I, I can give you later, but I mentioned the first day. Uh, this will be smaller than like square root of two ln two times this guy. Okay. C the A, the B over the C. Okay, so this guy. Um, uh, yes, correct, yes. This is some epsilon, very small, okay? So the two states are very close. So, so the state on rho AB is very close to maximum mixed, right? Um, but now, let me do it picture. So we have A, B, and C. And these two states, the reduced state here is very close to maximum mixed states, right? So it's very close to the maximum mixed state on A tends to the maximum mixed state on B. But now we can use this trick, right, that we used before. This, you know, in trace, this is in trace now, we can use purifications, right? So this means that there exists a purification where A is entangled with C and B is entangled with C as well, okay? And what's the amount of entanglement between A and C? Well, it's the entropy of A because A is only entangled with C, right, approximately up to this error. So they are in a maximum entangled state, right? So they are almost perfectly, you know, entangled, A and C. But now, uh, this is something that, you know, you have a max, suppose you have a maximum entangled state, let's call this maximum entangled, between A and C. And we look at the correlations. They are very big, okay? So they are bigger than half, right? So, so let me just write to you. This maximum entangled state is just uh, dimension of A minus half okay and, and to see the correlation is you just you know you, you measure you measure this observable for example so on on a you measure k from one to half of the states of the computational basis. And the same thing for C. This is the observer we're going to choose to see the correlations. Okay, and then if you just measure, if you compute this is calculation, this is on the A as well, right? So this is just on the part of C which is maximum entangled. With A. You see that it gives like half. So there's a lot of correlations in the maximum entangled state. But then there must be a lot of correlations in the state itself, right? Because, uh, because of Ulman, we can apply some change of basis here that cannot change the correlations between A and C. And then we get maximum entangled state between parts of C and A. And then we measure these correlations, and then we see that they, they are there, okay? 
So, so I, I'm showing you this, this calculation because uh, from, uh, you know, from the fact that you have a lot of entanglement, entanglement is almost close to maximum, we find that you must have long range correlations, right? The correlations between A and C, which are very far away, they must be very big. So you can reverse, you can say, well, so assuming that the correlations cannot be long, long range like this, just a simple argument gives us a bound on the entanglement, right? The entanglement must be smaller than that. Of course, it's a crappy bound, right? Because it's just say that you are very, you know, epsilon away from the maximum value. But it's something already in the direction, right? And what we want to do is just, uh, you know, to, to build on these arguments, okay? We want to, uh, you know, we, uh, on one hand, we want to start from a m much, uh, with a much stronger assumption, not only that there is no long range order, but that there is exponential decay of correlations. And we want to show that this implies that the entropy is not only bound away from maximum, but it's actually constant, okay? But it's kind of the same, the same kind of idea, right? So if they, we, we go like, you know, by contradiction, if the entropy is very big, this w because of what we understand about the entanglement, we will be able to show correlations in these states. And how we're going to show correlations in these states is to really distill entanglement there, to distill maximum entangled states. Because these, these we know they have a lot of correlations. Between? Oh yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, they are, they are very entangled. But of course, uh, they are not far away, right? So, because they are not far away, this doesn't contradict anything, right? But because A and C, they are far away, then we have long range correlations, right? Because B is separating them. Oh, no, 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 okay, so A and B, they have no correlations. No correlations, yeah. But B and C, they, they will have correlations, but this we don't care because they are neighboring. The important thing is that A and C, by this argument, they have a lot of correlations, okay? And this, if, okay, this happens for random states, it's just the reality, but what this argument shows is that if we assume that the state cannot have this kind of long range correlations, just the simple argument I did shows an upper bound on the entropy. Of course, it's a very bad, bad upper bound, but it's something already, you can bound the entropy, okay? So this, uh, this kind of idea is what we wanna use. Right. Uh, so, in, so in the last 10 minutes, let me finally go to entanglement distillation, okay? So how, how are we going to do that? We, whenever we have, uh, we, we will try to, suppose you want to prove by contradiction, as I said, right? You assume that every law does not hold true. So, you know, the entropy of this guy, for example, uh, grows with the size, and in particular becomes bigger than the entropy of this guy. What I want to do is to show that in this case, you can, you know, this will be a part of the argument at least, you can distill a EPR pair uh, by some local actions here between A and C. And because you can distill this EPR pair, then, right, there is correlations, okay? So, uh, you know, in the end it's not quite that, it's about the rates as well, how much you can distill, how, uh, you know, uh, what's the class of communication cost that you need to distill and so on. But this, the basic thing will be to understand entanglement distillation. So, so the, the basic idea of entanglement distillation is that we have a state, rho C, okay? And then A and C, they are far away from each other. A and C is what I explained in the first lecture, right? And because they are far away, you assume quantum communication is expensive, they can only communicate classically with each other. So, uh, you know, they share a state, rho. Alice can do everything allowed by quantum mechanics, make measurements, unitaries, add and seal, and so on. The same for Charlie, but they can only send bits, classical bits to each other. Okay, and this defines this class of operations that we saw that is called LOCC, right? And then you see much more uh, next week in Eric's lectures. So now the goal of entanglement distillation is to apply some LOCC protocol, just some physical operation implemented by LOCC to rho AC to distill the entanglement. Okay, so this might be entangled state, but entanglement might be in some very noisy form, right? And you want to map to a useful form. And useful form is in terms of EPR pairs. Right, this guy I just already wrote. Right, 
right? So we, you know, this uh, we are interested in doing this problem first for you know, for potential technological applications, right? So we want to do like teleportation in, in over long distances, but then if you try try to distribute entanglement, it will get noisy. We have to find ways of turning it into a pure state form like this, for which you can do teleportation, for example, right? Uh, but here you see that there will be some other applications. So, yes. Right, so no, this can be, you can try to distill from any states, right? Later you see that indeed when you have many copies, simplify things, right? Although in the end we have to remove these end copies because we'll be interested in single, single shot entanglement distillation, but we'll get there. Okay, so this is, this is defined for any state rho AC, and something we want to understand in general. <coughs> Unfortunately, we don't know much about this. Okay? No, we know quite a few things, but to solve the general problems, really to understand what are the best LCC protocols, this is very hard. Okay? Uh, there, is, there is nonetheless one restriction we can do, which simplifies things quite a bit. And this is what we call one-way LCC. Okay? And the idea here is that it's exactly like LCC, but there is only communication from Alice to Charlie. Okay? So the protocol becomes much simpler, right? Because all, everything they can do, Alice can make a, a measurement on the states, whatever she wants. She communicates the outcome to Charlie, and then Charlie does some, you know, some quantum channel, right? Applies some, like some unitary transformation, trace out. That's all, right? Because there is no back communication. So this is a much simpler class of protocols, uh, and and it's good because then we can, uh, you know, we understand it better, right? We have like. We can analyze, analyze it in, in a more simple way. So, um, so let, let me do some definition first. So we say that lambda, this is just some quantum, quantum operation. This is a one-way LOCC. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I will stop in less than five minutes. Uh, let me just put this definition and we'll be done. Okay, so there's three parameters. So this will be an entanglement distillation protocol uh, for the states rho C. If the following is true, so we apply this quantum, no, this physical LCC operation to rho AC, we want to get m copies of maximum entangled state, EPR pair, and we allow some error, which is epsilon, okay? So this is the number of, you know, this is how much entanglement you can extract from the state. Ah, and, uh, okay, uh, okay, and, and C is the uh, <coughs> number of bits of classical communication. Right, as, as I told you, the protocol is make a measurement, communicate something, and, and, then, and then Charlie does something else. So of course, we also care about how much classical communication we need, and this C gives that, okay? So this is how much entangle, entanglement you can extract, how much classical communication you need for that, the error that you have, okay? This defines entanglement distillation protocols. And this one-way LCC assumption doesn't appear here at all, but you appear in the form of the channel lambda. Okay, and, and I, will, I will show you this uh, next time. Now, I want to finish just by writing the best, the best protocol that we have. And we need it, so, with the last thing that I write, so it's a result by uh, Andreas and Winter and, and Igor Devetak, so let me write. Um, so if you want another reference with a different proof. Um, and what they show is just that, uh, you know, consider row AC with purification psi ABC, okay? Then they prove that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists this kind of protocols with one-way 
class communication, uh, LCC, uh, uh, with these parameters, okay? So, uh, uh, n times uh, what we call minus, this is the condition entropy that we're going to discuss. Uh, this is the number of bits that we can extract, EPR bits, okay, EPR pairs, E bits. The classical communication that they can get, that they need is um, the class communication that they need is the mutual information between A and B that we already saw. Okay, this epsilon, just think about it as zero if you want. So it's just something small. And the arrow decays like very fast, like exponential square root of n. Okay? But this is a, pro this is a, a distillation protocol, and then distillation protocol for rho AC to the power of n. Okay? So when we have many copies of the state, we have this something nice. Like this is the rate, this is the class of communication, this is the arrow. And we are going to next lecture start from this and see what it implies. Okay, so that's it. Thanks.